again, greetings, family. We're going to go at this time, go into our 10-point appeal and plan for the new black economy. Uh, and we're joined by our sister, Shaniri Norman, who is our vice president, along with Baba Kimbizi Merritt, who is our secretary. Take it away. Jay, why don't you um, lead us off with uh, questions that uh, will help us get into the conversation? Okay, I'll do that. Greetings, family. Before we start, what I would like to do is just go over our 10-point appeal and plan for the new black economy. Of course, in the last hour, those of you who were on the line at 9 o'clock got to hear quite a bit of information as far as us lifting us in the 10-point appeal and plan, but that's how we're going to break out this training and orientation hour. And every Thursday when we go over the different points, we'll go through all 10 and then go back to the one that we're on for the night. Tonight is point three. So as I begin, point one, as black people, we take full responsibility for the economic destiny of our communities and nation. Point two, black persons and black institutions, especially the black church, join together as members in a large-scale, cooperatively-owned business enterprise to pool our resources. Point three, this cooperatively-owned business enterprise is reflective of our unique culture and interest in the world. Point four, the governance and legal form of the cooperative accommodate demographic I'm sorry, democratic principles, one member, one vote with elected leadership. Point five, only members of the cooperative and not the public have the opportunity to secure ownership units, equity in the business enterprise with the potential to amass billions of dollars for community development. Point six. The cooperative focuses on opening and operating businesses in local communities that, one, provide needed goods and services, two, create new jobs, three, stimulate additional business activity, and four, yield a fair profit. Point seven, the cooperative is driven to duplicate and expand into hundreds and eventually thousands of businesses, all owned and controlled by the collective. Point eight. The net profits from overall cooperative success are used to, one, reinvest, two, are used for the distribution of grants and endowments, and three, direct returns or dividends to member owners of the cooperative. Point nine, The large-scale, cooperatively-owned, group-owned business functions as a catalyst and central element in building and sustaining the new black economy, one that gives power to our people. And point 10, Us Lifting Us Economic Development Cooperative LLC serves as the aforementioned model. So, again, every Thursday night we're going to be going through the entire 10 points so that if there's anyone who's listening in online and doesn't have access to the 10 points so that you can hear them all and understand what it takes for us lifting us to actually um, become this formation and this world-class business model. So going back to point three, which is the point for tonight, It says, this cooperatively owned business enterprise is reflective of our unique culture and interest in the world. So at this point, Bob Kimbezi, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. So let's get into a discussion about point three and how important it is to have a cooperatively owned business enterprise, our unique culture and interest in the world. So my thinking is this. When we talk about our unique culture and our interest in the world, 
whether we're talking about cooperatives or any other type of business formation, there are things that are definitely unique to our culture, as is other cultures. Why is it that we need a cooperative that speaks to our culture and our interests? I think you uh, – well, good evening, uh, sisters and brothers and those listening to our program tonight. The, the first thing we have to understand is that all economic systems are expressions of culture. Uh, in other words, it's the, it's the physical machine or mechanism that expresses what the culture of that community or society or nation is. Whatever values, whatever um, attitudes, whatever those ideas that the community holds as important or even sacred are reflected in the economics of how they interact one with another. Uh, where we're going with that is simply to say that an economy is the means of manufacturing and distrib distributing goods and services among a people. And how they do that expresses their thoughts and their views of how they, what is they think is important in life, how they value one another as, as beings on the planet, how they think about the planet itself, uh, so that the economic system if it's true to the society and the people, in every transaction, in every product that is produced, in every transaction that the people conduct, those values will be expressed and reflected. So when we talk about our unique culture, then we have to ask, well, what is essential, what is essential about African people that they are seeking to express economically? Um, I'll, I'll pause okay. there. Did you? Yeah, that, that's good. That's good. <clears throat> Actually, the next question for you is, you talked about our unique culture and the need for, basically for Ulu, but the question is, when we talk about, because you said this, controlling the economics of our community, what do we really mean when we say that? Well, the I think one of the things that we've been saying in Ulu is that Ujima, and that's the Swahili term for cooperative economics, is familyhood that builds an economy. Uh, in, in other words, in, in African societies, what was most important were the people and how they related one to another. And so in order for us to return to being able to make our own history, therefore we have to build our own economy. Otherwise, all we are is participants in the economies that some other people have built, and those economies have different agendas and different purposes. We find ourselves uh, ensnared in capitalism, which is all about profit and commodity exchange and maximize profit, even to the exploiting of people's labor, uh, exploiting of the environment itself. And, and so our challenge is to create an economic model that reflects that we believe that there is a supreme being, no matter what name you may use to refer to that being. We think uh -huh. that human life is at the essence and the core of, of what we mean by life. And so that should be reflected in the way we do business one with another. And until we get to the place where we have put together an economic system that enables us to honor one another, to honor <laughs> our women, to honor our children, to share the abundance that is on their planet, there, there is no real scarcity. It's just that a few people are hoarding all of the wealth for themselves. And the most valuable commodity on the planet is the African mind. It's not money. 
It's the ideas that flow from African genius. And that's what we have an abundance of. So our challenge is, is to use our own genius and to use that as the basis for the generation of wealth. That's why we have to build an economy that we control. Okay. Okay. So, and that is well, the source so of power, ultimately. On? I'm sorry, say that again for us. Uh, uh, ultimately, that is the source of our power. That is the source of our power. What is the quote? Uh, Africa is not poor. Africa is looted. The, it's, it's the wealthiest mm. uh, continent on the planet. Uh, there, there is no okay. lack of wealth, but it's being uh, it's being robbed and pillaged by by people for their own for their own good for their own purposes. So, would you say that because we really haven't been in control of the economics of our community, when we think of our children and we imagine what it is they see as power, um, what it is they see as the road in which they would like to take, how detrimental do you think it's been? And and we can we can kind of think about the things that have happened, I guess, this year and the last couple of years. Many people have been brought to the attention of the killings of our women and our children at a rate that I don't I don't really know um, if in the last ten years or so we've seen it like this. Definitely, probably not in the last twenty years. But what would you what would you say we can conclude from the fact that we haven't been in control of our economics and we're watching? the social ramifications, the political ramifications actually play out on a daily basis. How should we be, how should we see that as these things continue to occur? Well, I, I think what it makes us uh, aware of in the first instance is that we've reached a place in the economy of America and Europe for that matter where black labor um, is no longer needed. Um, Kawanja Kanjufu in his book Black Economics asked the question when was the last time that there was black full employment and and the answer is during slavery uh, but now as the as the economy of the world has become more and more automated and uh, computers and robotics are being used more and more uh, the need for manual labor uh, has dwindled and and so with with this decrease in the need and the use of black labor, that's why unemployment in black communities covers anywhere from 25 to 50 percent. There's no need for us. Uh, we're superfluous. Uh, uh, and, and therefore, if we're gunned down in the streets, if we're drugged up on, on poisonous drugs, if we are fed foods that don't sustain our health, if mm-hmm. all of the really good grocery stores are removed from our communities, leaving them as um, food deserts, um, mm-hmm. that's not a problem because we're not needed anyway. That's what mm-hmm. we haven't come to grips with, the fact that if we don't take control of the economics and begin to create employment for ourselves, and until we do that, that problem is not going to be solved. We, This is our problem we have to solve it, and the good news is we can solve it, and we can solve it through cooperatives, worker-owned cooperatives, consumer-owned cooperatives, uh, uh, member-owned cooperatives. It's a different way of uh, providing goods and services and distributing goods and services to one another without exploiting okay. each other. That's, that's the mm-hmm. key part. It allows us to share the wealth so that the majority of us thrive and flourish, not just a small uh, uh, group at the top, 1% or, or half of 1%, while everybody else lives in misery and, and struggles to make it, you know, paycheck to paycheck. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so politics, <clears throat> politics and economics are... Uh, are, are two sides of the same coin. Think, well, you know, you got to have political power, and until you get political power, you can't do anything economically, and 
Some want to make the argument that you got to have economic power. Uh, power is, is merely the ability to translate your thoughts and ideas into action. Uh, to take what you what your ideas are and make them manifest in in the front, in the physical world, and so poly, the act in truth, the economics drives power, and the policy uh. supports the economics. So we have to get to a place where we're building an economic base that reflects our unique culture and values, and for us that means things like. Unity, self-determination, uh, cooperative work and responsibility, cooperative economics, purpose, creativity, faith. Those are the values that have sustained African people for millennia, uh, but they are not reflected in capitalist economies. If anything, they are just the opposite in capitalist economies. Uh, the, the selfishness, the greed, the lust. Uh, uh, the exploitation, uh, the domination, uh, the competition for competition's sake, the devaluing of people, the devaluing of nature. Th- that is what capitalist economies have done in this country and around the world. Okay. Now, I, I, you said something about competition for competition's sake, and I would like to go into that a little bit deeper because what I want us to be able to do is to be able to connect those examples, those very tangible, very real examples with the principles of not just cooperative and cooperative economics, but ULU um, in particular. Before we get into that, though, I would like to for us to go ahead and take a call. We have a caller on the line that's waiting to ask a question. Can we open it up for that caller, please? Yes, 449-4457. Your line is open. Yeah, this is Abby O'Doon in New York. I just wanted to make a little comment to the exchange that was just uh, brought about um, in discussing cooperative economics and the like. Uh, one of the things I think that EU needs to address within the whole framework of what's already been put out there was the need, uh, as I've said to DJ and Hakima previously, is a need to focus the economics on a, a system of wants versus needs. If we, if we develop our strategy focusing on needfulness, uh, the needs of our individuals and our families and our newly married couples and our seniors and what have you, the needfulness of our uh, uh, of mental issues and health issues and what have you, the needfulness, the wants thing will fall in place as a matter of fact. If we, if we just can't get carried away on the wants, we'll be running around here looking to manufacture and sell sneakers and what have you, which could be very profitable, but it's not like the needfulness end of the uh, of the coin. Okay, that's all I had to say. Yep, right. Okay. Well, that's a good point, um, and I appreciate that comment. And uh, Bobby Kimbezi, I'll you know allow you to expound in the way that in the way we're doing this hour is I'll be pretty much asking questions and um, Bobby Kimbezi expounding. But definitely, I would say that if there's anyone who who hasn't recognized at this point that Ulu is really speak the plan, the move, the actions that Ulu takes are really steeped in the needs um, of our people. The want, those things, first of all, because of the system by which we're living under at this point, many people are confused about want and need, to be perfectly honest with you. I think our model really speaks to the need. And then when you, and, and I hope, hope that we're in the same vein, but when you can identify needs, then out of answering those needs, particular wants that are really in line with African people are answered anyway. Um, and so, Baba Kimbizi, you heard the question as well. Dive into that a little bit, if you will, and um, then we'll go to the next point. Um, I, I think the brother raises uh, a critical point uh, to separate what uh, – what is genuinely needed in our community from the things that we 
we may have been conditioned to want to think that it's important. And, and I think there's a couple of examples that uh, come to mind very quickly. For those in the metropolitan um, Atlanta area, especially uh, in DeKalb County, you may be familiar with Stonecrest Mall. It was a mall that was built, oh, I guess about a decade and a half ago. Uh, it was a very ambitious product project, uh, but for the last five to seven years, it's been languishing. And uh, the latest word is is that uh, it's about to go bankrupt if it hasn't gone bankrupt. And you can begin to see the deterioration of, uh, of the whole property. Uh, uh, at the same time, we are very familiar with this, this notion of food deserts in, in predominantly black communities, uh, so much so that we've had communities where there have been major grocery chains that have pulled out. Uh, leaving a food wasteland uh, in their wake. The question is, to the brother's point about dealing with needs, food, clothing, and shelter are basic needs that, that every community has to supply for itself. So what if the communities uh, would be some of these vacated large um, grocery stores were to take over those spaces as a cooperatively run business? In other words, the business is not owned by outsiders who uh, set up a price structure to create a profit for themselves, and because they couldn't make a certain price, a profit point, they shut down the business. Suppose the community that relied upon that food took over those grocery stores, and instead of running it uh, in a capitalistic way, ran it as a cooperative. In other words, the community owns the store. The products that the people want to eat are put in the store, and the profits that the business generates goes back to the community in the form of quarterly dividends to the, co to the cooperative holder and into building up the infrastructure of the surrounding neighborhoods. That's a, a different model for providing goods and services, one based on needs rather than based on want. As, as, as one example of why a cooperative model serves our communities better than a profit-driven um, capitalist model. Does that make sense okay. to you, Shay? Absolutely. Of, of course that makes sense to me. Of course it does. And I hope the brother, um, you know, is, is, is still there and um, actually heard that answer uh, to your question, to that question. Yes, I, I, this is Abby doing again. I'm still here. I heard that, uh, this, and, I, and, I, and I'm glad to see the brother made a specific frame of reference to the food, clothing, and shelter thing, because that's exactly what I meant to use it myself in terms of needfulness. We have to be able to provide those basics. And a few years ago when I was called upon to address some young students and I brought up this issue about food, the young man was quick to tell me, well, in New York we can't have no farms. Well, that's quite right. You're not going to have no farms within the city. However, there are other aspects of food. You know, there's shipping, storage, processing, uh, packaging, all that stuff that's, that's, that's about food. We can do that from a variety of different places for a variety of different things. So uh, we don't need to get handicapped in our thinking on these issues because there are many different aspects that, that, that go into bringing a, a product to the shelf. And, and and we need to use our imaginations in that regard. Absolutely. And I'm gonna I'm gonna lend this um comment and then hopefully we are gonna go ahead and move to the next point. Definitely appreciate you um, you know, giving rise to that particular um uh, concern. You said that we it, even in New York we can't grow food and I beg to differ. I really believe that, especially when you harness energy of cooperative economics and putting like minds together, nothing is impossible. And even in a city full of concrete and full of buildings, there is still the opportunity to create whatever it is that we want to create, and there are ways in which that is happening. Um, so I would I would encourage you to, and anyone who's listening in who thinks that a garden can't be created, 
and flourish in a particular city, before you say it can't be done, I would definitely say um, try it out because it's being done. And it's not necessarily what you think of when you think of a farm, but as far as growing food, going growing fresh food that's good for us to eat, it, it definitely can be done. Um, and again, thank you, thank you for that for that input. That that's that's very important when we talk about our needs and addressing our needs. Um, Bobby Kimbezi, I want to go back to a point. I, I had a next question for you, but you hit upon something that I think is really important for us. I want us to always, when we're doing these trainings and orientation calls, I always want us to focus on how these principles, how these cooperative principles, how ULU particularly and our mission shows up in the everyday lives of our people. So when you talked about competition, you know, oftentimes if you're a person who's um, you know, you're really serious about being the best and doing the best that you can. You can be in competition with yourself in a way um, and doing the best that you can. But when you talk about hyper competition and you talk about capitalism, make the distinction between those two because I think that a highly motivated person or someone who is apt to look at Ulu and say, okay, this is an alternative to what we're seeing today. I really, really like it. Um, I want more of it. I want to be a part of it. But a lot of times we are so bogged down with competing against one another that the lines can get blurred. How do you think we should really address how competition shows up in our lives when we're talking about being the best that we can be as an individual, but also competing against one another. What does that do to us when we compete against one another? What, what's wrong with that? Well, I, I think that the answer to that question in part goes back to, again, the, uh, the focus of this, uh, of this third point, this idea of a unique culture. So then, uh, there are places where Competition has its place. It makes sense. But overall, what we need more than anything else is cooperation. We, we don't need three or four stores on the same block selling sneakers. Uh, when there's a need for quality schools, health care, grocery stores, in other words, if we were to pool our resources, and to build a, a, a grocery operation of some significant scale that could meet the needs of the community, that would be a better use and investment of our, of our money than having uh, a bodega on every corner. You, you follow what I'm saying? Where, where Absolutely. you may have four or five, quote, unquote, entrepreneurs competing for uh, uh, the resources in that community by selling um, junk food, snacks, and, 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 and sodas and chips, where, where what, what's really needed is a place where people can get fresh produce and fresh fruit and, 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 and have high-quality food so that their health will improve. Um, uh-huh. So that, again, as a, as, a, as a value, as a cultural value, um, African people, because of our intelligence, our first uh, order of business was always cooperation. Uh, you know, organize the resources and, and the businesses in such a way that the basic needs are met. And when you do that in, in, a, in, a, in a culture that values human life, then it's not so much about um, people competing to be the very, to be, on top of one another. In other words, uh-huh. to uh, to keep up with the Joneses or to constantly be setting um, a pace that that always makes you at the top of the the social order. But more uh-huh. importantly, to to create a, a society that is more horizontal, where uh-huh. everyone's right. gifts are being developed, and the pleasure of life is sharing those gifts one with another, not uh-huh. having to be where one household has more wealth, has 10 times the wealth of, of, of the next 100 households. 
that, that builds these inequalities that then leads to all kinds of um, tension and friction and, 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 and anger and hostility, not to mention okay. stress. Okay. Well, I, I do want to – thank you for answering that question. I do want to remind our listeners that you are open to ask a question or give a comment, and um, all you have to do is press 1, the number 1 on your phone, and we'll open up your line so that you are free to express yourself and give energy to this conversation. Uh, Brother DJ, do we have anyone holding at this time? No, not at this time, but I'm definitely on the lookout. If someone pushes one, I'll uh, I'll let you know, and, uh, you know, you can let me know when to open up the line for a question or a comment, but we're good now. Okay, okay, thank you. So oh. there's something that you said um, a couple of times, and um, I want us to give more meat to this. When we talk about power, right, you you said it a couple of times, and I'm sure in the last hour it was said over and over, define power for us. There's a couple of ways. There are several ways to, to understand or think about power. One of them that I said earlier was the ability to translate uh, one's thoughts and ideas into action. Uh, the ability to uh, um, take a thought or an idea and make it manifest on the physical plane, uh, those are expressions of power. Uh, it was interesting to me that um, uh, one of our greatest thinkers and strategists, Almakar Cabral, made the point that when people have and control their own economy, that's when they return to the path of making history. So in other words, we have people who have an idea, uh, something that would improve the quality of life, a, a product that would make life more enjoyable and more meaningful. But it's only an idea. So they, they need an economic mechanism to actually build it, to make it physical so that people can live it, walk in it, actually handle it. Uh, when they create those kinds of goods, or even if, they're, if, if, if it's a service that they're creating, that becomes uh, an artifact of history. In, in other words, the rest of the world can take note that up until this people made this product or this service, it didn't exist on the planet. But because of their genius, because of their creativity, because of their imagination, now the whole world can benefit from a new way of understanding the possibilities of what life can be on the planet. That's the ability oh. to make history. And when it's made based on a set of values, uh, a certain way of understanding the world, then that makes it unique to the planet. And that's, where, that's why we're trying to break out of these economic systems that other societies have foisted upon us and return to creating our own economic model so that we once again, as a people, can make history. That's part of what it means to be a sovereign people. We make our own history. And we cannot do that apart from owning and controlling an economic model that we have created out of our own genius, out of our own energy, out of our own labor. That's the challenge that is before us in, in, in this historical moment. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's an expression of power. Mm -hmm. But if all we're thinking about is, is how to make the next unique sneaker or to put designs on the sneakers that we've bought, uh, we're missing the opportunity to um, to take our place on the world stage. Uh, if you think yeah. about the, 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 the civilizations that built the pyramids, that was such a profound creation that, you know, almost, you know, thousands and thousands of years later, they're still standing 
and the mathematics and the engineering skills that went into building that still baffle the best scientific minds of other communities around the world. They still don't know how they were able to move those 70-ton blocks uh, uh, without the, you know, the use of steam and hydraulics, uh, but yet they're there. Um, it's, it's very interesting. It's very interesting that you went there uh, in regards to the pyramid because the next question I I had for you was in reference to wealth, and um, I want to ask the question. I want you to talk about wealth and what it means, but to tie that in when you talk about the pyramids something that is still withstanding and has been standing for so very long, that is an example of wealth. And I think that we're we're a bit confused. We're a bit confused about what wealth really is. And so with that example in mind for, for myself and for everyone else who's in earshot of this call, talk speak to that. What what is the meaning of wealth? That you know, we've we've had reason to ponder this question for for some time, and we we had a very interesting conversation a couple of years ago at our economic summit, when mm-hmm. our brother Ak Aku said that uh, the African mind is is the source of all wealth on the planet, and it, it, that kind of just everybody in the room got real quiet, uh, and then the other night. Uh, Brother Hakima made the comment that money is not power. And and that was such a jarring comment that it, it caused everyone to kind of do a double take because all of our lives, most of us in this country, have been, have been just um, conditioned with this idea that money is power. When you get money, you got power. Uh, the people who have real power know that money is just a means of exchange. It's not the real mm-hmm. power. Um, w- money only has power to the degree that there is genuine wealth behind it. And so wealth sometimes is defined as an abundance of valuable possessions or money, but that's misleading. Yeah. Money, uh, wealth is not the abundance of valuable possessions. The valuable possessions are an expression of wealth. But the valuable uh, 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 possessions are the byproduct of the mind that produced whatever that is. So when you get back to the source of whatever it is that you say is valuable, that is the real true source of wealth. And that's why I, I, I made the comment that, going back to what Brother Uncle Ku said, that the African mind is the most valuable resource on the planet because it is the source from which all of these ideas emanate. Do you follow what I'm saying? In, in other words, yes. even something as, as quote-unquote valuable as, uh, um, uh, what is it? Is it, is it tantalum, this, in this mineral that goes into making um, computers, and, and it's found uh, uh, 80% of it is in the Congo. But the only reason it's valuable is because it's a resistor that enables cell phones to work. So whoever, whoever, whoever came up with the idea of putting together a cell phone, that's the real wealth. Now, because you need that, that mineral resource to make it work, it becomes valuable. But it's valuable because it plays a function in, in the, the operation of cell phones. Now, what's amazing is that 80% of this mineral is in the Congo. So why are the people in the Congo poor? Mm. Because other nations have swooped in and are, and are, ga- are gathering that resource out of the soil of the Congo and making these cell phones and benefiting from it while holding the people of the Congo in abject poverty. So money is not the wealth. It's the ideas that produce the things that people need. And if you can unleash the African mind, that is the source of tremendous wealth 
and that is why so much energy is spent controlling black behavior and black thought. If we ever get loose <laughs> from the grip of these other nations and cultures, the world will, will see a revolution in, in, in productivity and creativity that it hasn't seen for, for, for the last 10, 20,000 years. Hmm. So, so that's, wow. that's, that's wow. how I think we, it's helpful if we think about wealth in that way. It's, it's not the thing. Okay. It's the idea. And what is the source of that idea? That's the wealth. Yeah. Mind, the African a, mind. So a sovereign mind well, that has its own value system and its own uh, world view, because that's something that we also need to talk about. An African world view. That's what then really unleashes an African-driven uh, cooperative economy. Okay. Now, as as we're listening. To Baba Kimbezi, um, keep in mind anyone who has a question or a comment or would like to delve deeper into a certain point, please let us know by pressing the number one on your phone, and we will um, open your line up so that you can uh, give energy to the call. Shay, we do have a, a, a caller with a question. Great. Okay, we've got uh, 2919. Two nine one nine. Your line is open. Uh, greetings, family. This is Benita. Greetings, and Benita. How you doing? I'm doing just fine. How are you all? Doing great. Good. Um, I just wanted to kind of, um, I guess, piggyback off of the the conversation that was just being had by Brother um, Kim Beasy. Um and just kind of want to take some time and and read just a small excerpt from a book that um, I guess in point three, um, I, my question, I guess, was going to be whatever you all could suggest um, to potentially elevate our people to that level of understanding because I think um, we probably could find ourselves um, commonly encountering uh, brothers and sisters that are just going from, you know, I guess the, the analogy would be like a, a, a ostrich with its head in the sand kind of approach to now an awakening. And I think the key still is the connectivity to our culture that may be skipped. And I think the one book that helped me um, kind of bridge that, that gap um, in my own uh, just, just will to want to know more um, was a book by um, Anthony T. Browder and its survival strategies um, for Africans in America, 13 Steps to Freedom. But um, nonetheless, it kind of gets into the grid of things and, and what Brother um, Kim Beasley was pointing to just in the, in the sense of um, the disconnect from our cultural values and, and principles and ideals. Sometimes it's just that, that social realm that people just aren't aware of. So if you all have any, um, you know, materials that people probably who who aren't as apt to, to to know as much about what cooperatives are, what the culture truly is about, who are just in that discovery phase, if you have any direction for, for, for our brothers and sisters that might just need that extra, um, you know, informative feedback from you all, that probably would be great. That's great. I, I was That's hoping great. Benita would make would I thought she was going to share a, a a quote or a snippet from that book. Oh yes, it it was just the the introduction on the back is essentially um, we Africans in America have been socially engineered to reject our past, and far too many of us live in a state of suspended animation. We deny the historical realities confronting us daily. Too many of us mistakenly believe that the past has no bearing on the present and is unrelated to the future. Thus, we have been conditioned to live our lives disconnected from cultural values, principles, and ideals essential for peaceful living. And that's just one excerpt from it. Okay. Um, thank you for sharing that. I, I, let, me, let me throw this question out, Shay, as, as a way of making our conversation uh, perhaps a little more concrete. Uh, I was mm -hmm. driving through a neighborhood yesterday, and I saw um, 
uh, a family who had been set out uh, of of their of their house, and all their burnt, all their belongings were were on the sidewalk. You know, the bedding, the dresses, the couches, the clothes. You know, and, and people were trying to, you know, salvage right. as much as they could. And, and I right. thought to myself, as a cultural expression, some of us would think, well, if you can't pay your rent, you're supposed to get set out. And, and uh-huh. they see nothing wrong with that. Or uh-huh. if they're part of the um, what's called now the black political class who, are, who now have become property owners, uh, they talk uh-huh. about all the hard uh, challenges and hoops they had to go through in the legal system to get these people evicted from their property so they can get some people in there who can pay the rent and, and make them a profit. You, you follow the scenario where I'm going with this? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so, so the question that I'm asking in my mind is what, what, are, what is the culture of a community that says it's okay to put people in the street when they can't uh, pay their uh, rent. Now, uh, if we accept that, that's a degree of conditioning to American capitalist norm. In an African community, if someone had, was on such hard times that they could not maintain their dwelling place, the community would find a way to provide them shelter for them and their children so that what few valuables they had left would not be then ruined by being put on the street and people coming by and scooping it up, or worse, the rain come down and really drive them uh, all the way in, in, into impoverishment. It, it says something about a culture that says it's okay to evict people from shelter because they can't pay the rent. That, that's a that's a that's a that's a worldview. And Mm -hmm. what it says, it says something about the relationships that are not present that allows one group of people to do this to another group of people, and it's okay. In in an African value-driven economy, that that would not even happen. Right. You follow what I'm saying? There would be people to, to intervene long before it got to being someone being evicted because children are involved. Uh, 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 these are family members that have come on hard times, and we always have pitched in to help one another in hard times until they could get back on their feet. So that's what, when we in Ulu are talking about our unique culture, we're trying to get back to a place of relationship and relatedness where everyone is viewed as valuable and the welfare of one is as important as the welfare of all or is connected to the welfare of all. And until we get to that, we're still in a very, in a very precarious kind of position. But I put that out there as an example because that causes us to reflect on well, what are our values. If, if, if I'm a landowner, then, and I and I argue that well they should be put out because they couldn't pay the rent. Right. They tore up the place. Right. And and that's what they deserve. Mm-hmm. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Benita, thank you. Thank you very much. As actually, I wanted to end the call at eleven with a suggested read, um, but I would like for us because you so just so naturally gave that particular example. For us to, for everyone who's listening, if you, if you have not read, and if you are looking for something to connect you more to the culture, or pretty much put the pieces of the puzzle together as to why, you know, you may not be as 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 connected to the culture. Benita gave a very great example of Anthony Browder's. Um, Benita, are you still? Is your line still unmuted? Can you hear me? Yes. Give the um, give the title to the book once more, please. Oh, okay. The book title is Survival Strategies for Africans in America, 13 Steps to Freedom by Anthony T. Browder. 
Okay. And maybe maybe what we can do um, on one of our calendars, this is only privy to Ulu members, maybe what we can do is go back and give the suggested read for each Thursday night call. I think that would be a good idea just so we can show um, the progression. And at some point, everyone, all the membership will be able to see some of those same books, videos, excerpts, and uh, we all have like a collection of them. I, I do want to mention this briefly. We have a caller waiting, but I want to mention this briefly. You talked about the lack of the relationship between people under the capitalistic um, model or system, and I just want to say that um, the relationship does exist, but it, like you said earlier, it exists for the express purpose of profit. And so when we look at that triangular or top-down model, that is exactly what you get. And then on contrast, I mean, it would be great if we were showing a webinar, if you could see my screen, but oftentimes I put side-by-side a a pyramid, and then on side of it I put a, a circle showing how we can expand our wealth when we use this circular model. And it doesn't matter how far out it goes. Um, in, in so many different ways, you can show how a uh, pyramid or a top-down model is finite. And that's what's going on now when we talk about this particular system, this global capitalistic system, because it's not just here, um, beginning to eat itself from the inside out. That is a finite system where in which, the, on the contrast, when we're talking co-op, cooperative economics, This is a circular model that as long as we give energy to it, it can continue to expand and expand and expand. And that, in my mind, is an expression of true wealth that never ends. So that's the ULU model uh, when when we're talking about cooperative economics. DJ, there's a caller waiting. Can we open their line, please? Sure. Uh, We're going to go at this time to... 7124, 7124, call your line is open. Please state your name and where you're calling from, please. Greetings, fam- Greetings family. This is uh, Chris calling from Macon, Georgia. Greetings, brother. Greetings. I just got to, well, really, you know, as I sat on hold with my question, I think Brother Cam- Bob uh, Cambizi really touched on it with this thorough explanation of the African community worldwide, you know, socially and culturally, what we're going through, but um, I'll still ask it anyway as related to point number three, and maybe if you want to expand a little more, that would be great. Um, It's worded very interestingly, point number three, and my question was really pertaining to what interest specifically relates us to the African community with our unique culture. Um, I think you really expanded on it very well, but are there any specific interests that relates to Africans worldwide, our community worldwide, that maybe don't pertain to other cultures, that pertain to us uniquely within our culture? You there? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, Did you hear me? Say, you yeah, yeah. We we heard the question, brother. Go, okay. go ahead, uh, Bob. It can be there. Well, um, I, I would answer that question. I would begin to answer that question this way. Uh, keep in mind that we we are the first culture, so that the best of 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 our genius, of our creativity, uh, has has really been taken around the world. Uh, but if 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 I had to, you know, be more precise and say what is uniquely African. It, one, it has to do with um, this idea of, um, of, of there being, I, I don't want to use the term supreme being, but, but I, I want to say that there's this idea of divine consciousness and will that permeates all life, that is the source of life, that is life, and that everything, and this is the, the principle of unity, brother. Everything is connected and interdependent. When you start with from that premise that everything is interconnected and interdependent, then this whole idea of um, enemies and uh, people being adversarial to one another 
is driven by their unawareness of the fact that at the root of everything, we're all one. And that, that's one of the lessons that we've learned from um, environmental science, this idea of these interpenetrating ecosystems, that if you affect one blade of grass over here, it, 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 it has a bearing on how flowers and plants and trees will grow over there. And if you destroy the bees over here, other life forms and species will be, they'll be compromised over there. So there was this holistic worldview that permeated everything that we thought, said, and did that is uniquely uh, a, a product of, of, of the African genius. And, and it issues in forms of cooperation. It enters in forms of reverencing of life. Uh, it shows up in working together to build things that benefit everybody, not just a few. It celebrates creativity so that uh, we, we're always doing what we do in new and interesting ways. Uh, there's this abiding faith that it's going to work out okay in the end if, if we continue to, to, to support one another. Um, and and that's at the that's at the very basis of of the societies that we built. Uh, in ancient Egypt, it was called Ma'at, you know, uh, truth and righteousness and justice and uh, order and harmony and balance and reciprocity. Um, these were the, the 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 cultural matrix that undergirded everything that we did and the communities that we built. Uh, and, and they're still very active, you know, today. Uh, a lot of them are under assault, but, but there's evidence uh, of this. Any, anywhere, you know, there are concentrations of African descended people. So, so I would say that would be one way of answering your question about what is uniquely African. And, and, and what is the contribution we're making to the globe? Appreciate it. You good, brother? All right. Yeah, I'm good, Thank brother. You for your DJ. For sure. Uh, uh, let me add on one last thing then. Um, if we got just, I know mean, we got a little couple minutes left. Okay. Go ahead, brother. Go ahead, brother. Okay. Um, are there any economic interests? And I thank you for your for your thorough explanation, and I felt that. Um, are there any economic interests that pertain to our culture also, um, specifically, that you would say? Well, that that's a good question. And if you think about all of the things that we've talked about as being uniquely African, then how does that express itself in an economic model? So it means then that, for example, we can't talk about owning the land because we didn't make the land, if you follow what I'm saying. So at best, we can share the land. We, we can find ways to cooperate and use the land collectively. You don't have to put up a fence and, say, and stick up a flag and say, this is mine and you can't come over here. Does that make any sense? So from You're an economic right. standpoint, when we are growing food, the, the land belongs to the community. The food is grown so that everybody can eat, and there's no, there's no way that one family is going to starve simply because their crop fails. When, when the other nine families or however many are in the village, when, when their crops were successful. Um, and for those, for those of us who grew up in the South and know anything about the South, a lot of people had these garden plots, and they always produced more than they could eat, so they would walk up and down the street and share the surplus of what they had grown. So there was always food available for everybody. Wasn't nobody hungry. So from an economic standpoint, the way those values play out is that we share the re we share the material resources of the planet so that everybody is able to have food, clothing, and shelter at a minimum. 
And then as the, as, the, as the community grows stronger and stronger and stronger, everybody benefits in the surplus. It's never hoarded for just a handful who have the, who have the muscle power to hoard it for themselves and beat everybody back, as, as, as we see in this country. You know, build a fence, keep them out, that kind of madness. Uh, we look Definitely. for ways to share the resources of the planet. We, we don't have a problem yeah. with everybody having uh, a, 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 a standard of living that they're comfortable. Yes, sir. Shay, you want to give us some closing words? We're drawing down on the uh, on the end of the program. Go ahead and give us some closing words before we sign off for the night. Absolutely. Uh, Bob Kim Beasy, just want to thank you, as I'm sure I'm speaking for everybody on the call, uh, for bringing the words of wisdom that you did and speaking to that third point on the 10-point appeal. I, I simply can say I am because we are. We are because I am. That is our wealth, and that is what Ulu is designed for, is for to promote that. We'll be on again next week, sisters and brothers. Everyone, thank you for joining us tonight. We'll be on again next week, 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, point number four. Point number four.